You know, my first trip to Mexico was in 1963. It was my first bullfight, my first taste of cilantro. It took me years to actually learn to love it. And of course, my first taste of authentic Mexican food. So today, we are traveling back to central Mexico to figure out how to make real guacamole, hold the garlic. We're also gonna make a chipotle shrimp dish with a shrimp almost cooked themselves. And finally, we're gonna take a side trip to Tulum to figure out how to make a great chili pineapple margarita. Stay tuned and hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Milk Street. Thank you for coming. Okay. Now, we should have them every day, just here. I know. Just every week, come into the office. Really hey, how are you? Myself. So uh, today we're gonna do uh, a recipe from Mexico. And I always thought that Mexican cooking was, was complex. You know, it was a mole sauce, six different kinds of chilies, which some recipes actually have. It takes three days to make, et cetera, et cetera. This is shrimp and chipotle sauce. Not too many ingredients, really simple. Uh, the shrimp almost cooked themselves, one might say, That's as true. you will show us. So how do we get started? One of the hallmarks of authentic home cooking in Mexico is layering a lot of flavor using simple ingredients. So we're gonna start by making a tomato sauce that has just three ingredients. We have four vine ripened tomatoes here that have been quartered. When you cut these, you really wanna make sure you keep the juice, keeping all the flavor at every level. So do you believe in Santa Claus? Yes. <laughs> So do you believe in vine ripened? I mean, just because they're on a vine doesn't mean they taste better. Fresh tomatoes. Okay. When you're buying them in the supermarket, on the vine have a tendency to be the freshest ones. If you have a lovely garden, pick your tomatoes off the vine, fresh. Use fresh tomatoes. We want the sweetness of the tomato and we want this juicy texture. We don't want mealy tomatoes here. We have four chipotles and adobo. And when you're pulling out your four chipotles, keep the sauce on there. We're gonna use that in here to flavor this with some spice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if you find that this is too spicy, you obviously just cut back on the chipotles. It's just supposed to have a kind of lingering heat. You really wanna still be able to taste the actual chili, not just breathe it's, it's like fire. Me. I, have, I have lingering heat. <laughs> You'll remember me for days after. That is There's some truth. Definitely <laughs> Okay. And we're gonna put that in a food processor and just process it until it's almost smooth. I'm gonna try not to touch these and burn my hands. And then a half a teaspoon of salt. So I'm gonna process this for about a minute until it's mostly smooth. Okay, Chris, so you can see, still has a little bit of texture to it, but mostly smooth. And we're actually gonna set this aside for now and talk about our shrimp. So this is one and a half pounds of extra large shrimp. When you're shopping in the supermarket, it can be kind of confusing the way they label shrimp. Some are labeled by a descriptor, like large, extra large, and some are labeled by a count. These are 21 to 25. Which means that 21, 21 to 25 weigh a pound. Exactly. Yeah. Put two tablespoons of olive oil in the pan. We're gonna heat that up until it is just smoking. Then we're gonna add the shrimp and we're only gonna cook them for 45 seconds. And this is the only time that the shrimp is gonna be over direct heat. You love to shock me, don't you? You just I think know. I'm just gonna fall over see, and I go can, like, what, 45 I can seconds? I see in your face, you're like, but they'll still be raw after 45 seconds. We're gonna continue to cook them later in the sauce, but it's not gonna be over direct heat. So I'm only gonna add half the shrimp to the pan right now. We don't want to overcrowd the pan and have these shrimp steam. We're trying to just get a little bit of color on one side because that's going to add just a little bit of flavor. Like I said, we're layering the flavor as we go. You can see they've got a little bit of browning on the other side here, so we're going to take them off. I bet it's been 45 seconds. That's right, give them a quick shake. And then I'm going to transfer them to this bowl. So this bowl has two tablespoons of lime juice in it. Again, layers and layers of flavor. So while this shrimp is sitting and we're gonna continue making our sauce, we wanna allow that to sit in something that's got some flavor. Just gonna give it a little toss. And you can see the backside of these shrimp are not cooked at all. The front side has a great color. 
So I'm gonna add this next batch in here. We're gonna finish cooking these, and then we'll come back and combine our sauce and shrimp. So Chris, we've quickly cooked our shrimp. Now we're gonna finish our sauce. We're gonna add two tablespoons of olive oil to the pan, and this is one medium onion that's over medium high heat. And this is just gonna cook until it's softened and gets a little bit of browning, and that's about four minutes or so. So our onions have softened, they're a little bit browning, and we're gonna add three garlic cloves that we've thinly sliced, and half a teaspoon of dried oregano. So we're just gonna cook this for about 30 seconds. So we're gonna deglaze our pan with a quarter cup of wine, dry white wine here, and then I'm gonna ask you to drain the juice from our bowl of shrimp. I have to do something? You're, yeah. What are you, you're not here just to look pretty, Chris. <laughs> you're just waiting for the shrimp to end up, right? This is your moment. You've been waiting I'll 10 help. years I'll for help. this. And we're just gonna let this cook until it's mostly evaporated. So we're gonna now add the tomato sauce that we made earlier. Again, this is tomatoes, chipotles, and salt, that's it. So Chris, we're gonna cook this for about 10 minutes, just until it thickens, and then we're gonna add the shrimp and finish cooking those. If you love your winter vacation, I'm sure you know about Tulum. It's an alternative resort destination about two hours south of Cancun in the Yucatan of Mexico. Well, it has lots of wonderful places, but the Heartwood restaurant is probably the best. It has wonderful food grilled over wood. It also has a wonderful bartender. And one of the things they make down there is the piña margarita, or the pineapple margarita. Now, the thing that makes it so wonderful is they also use habanero, a very spicy chili. So we brought that recipe back to Milk Street, and today we're going to make a piña margarita. To start off, we infuse a simple syrup. In a small saucepan, we combine one cup of sugar, one cup of water, four one-inch strips of both lime zest and orange zest, one jalapeno chili and one habanero chili, both of them halved. Next, bring the mixture to a boil, and you should stir occasionally. Finally, remove from the heat and let the mixture steep for about 15 minutes. Strain into a jar, discard the solids, and then let cool. Next, in a small bowl, stir together a tablespoon of kosher salt, three-quarter teaspoon of chili powder, and one and a half teaspoons of sugar. Now, spread the mixture on a small plate. Then use an orange wedge to moisten the rims of two rocks glasses then dip in the chili salt, turning to coat. In a cocktail shaker, combine a half a cup of Reposado tequila, a quarter cup of pineapple juice, three tablespoons each of lime juice, and the chili syrup. Now, this is a cocktail that can stand a lot of shaking, and that's because the sugar and the syrup and the pineapple juice help stabilize the foam. So you want to shake pretty vigorously for about 15 or 20 seconds. Strain into the prepared glasses. And since I made it, I get to have the first taste. That's almost as good as being in Tulu. A chili pineapple margarita. So Chris, the sauce has been cooking for about 10 minutes. You can see it's gotten a lot thicker. As you drag your spatula through, it leaves a trail that doesn't fill back in. Now we're gonna cook our shrimp, but I'm gonna turn the heat off because we're actually gonna cook this with the residual heat in the pan. So I'm gonna add the shrimp, give it a little toss so it's got all the sauce on it. So this is a dumb question, and you'll point that out to me in a second, I'm sure, but <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's cooked side up or down. No. No. But it does matter that you have a very tight-fitting lid here. So these are gonna just stay off the heat for about four minutes. Set my timer. So I'm just gonna chop up an avocado. Would you place that over there with the rest of our accompaniments to our tacos? We've got a few more seconds left before our shrimp are done and they will be magically cooked without any heat. Well, some heat, but residual heat, no direct heat. <laughs> Look at that, Chris, perfectly cooked shrimp. I'm going to finish this with half a cup of cilantro, coarsely chopped, and two more tablespoons of lime juice. Just gonna give that mm. a toss. And I'm just going to give it a taste for salt. It's a little... Uh-oh. <laughs> if it's too hot for you, just then... put in a little pepper. You know, you always get a bad rap for 
having an aversion to spicy food. I'm not a big fan of spicy food either. Oh. Let's eat it. You're, you're, you're a closet <laughs> milk toast. I don't like spicy food person. Okay. We'll get some tortillas. And these are corn tortillas that we've warmed a little bit so they're pliable. You know, I do tacos. I always put too much in. I do that I too. Yeah. yeah. So we've got some avocado, cilantro. I'm going to need this because I have a feeling I will that too. there's a... <laughs> we've got some sour cream on there. And I'm just going to squeeze a little bit of lime on. Now, there is a rule, which you should never eat shrimp tacos on television. You know, this, this is going to be a disaster. Yep. And it's going to be spicy, too. Mmm. At the beginning, it's never spicy. Mm -hmm. But then you count to 10, and then you go, here it right. comes. It's coming now. It's like it's arrived. It's that lingering heat. But it, it does have layers of flavor. As you promised. Well, the thing I like about this is just very few ingredients, uh, very easy to do. The shrimp almost cooks by itself, and it's real home cooking. I mean, it's, it's simple, but it, it's interesting. So today in Milk Street, we learned how to take a central Mexican recipe, which is shrimp and chipotle sauce, and make it at home with only, what, seven or eight ingredients, and the shrimp mostly cook by themselves. And as you promised, there are, in fact, layers of flavor. And it's nothing like those really complex dishes. And it's nothing like what you buy at takeout. Shrimp and Chipotle sauce from Central Mexico. Lynn, thanks. Great job. All right. And now I'm going to make a mess. Great cooking isn't always about technique. You don't need expert knife skills or tons of time to put something really delicious on the table. At Milk Street, we love salsas and other fresh condiments that add bright, bold flavor to dishes. One such sauce is adobo, which is the Spanish word for marinade and was originally used to preserve foods. Today, we're gonna make a cilantro jalapeno adobo. It's a lot like a pesto or a salsa, but it lasts for weeks in the fridge. You can fold it into rice, you can slather it on a quesadilla, or brush it onto grilled meats and fish. It's a really simple way to add extraordinary flavor to everyday cooking. To start, heat the broiler with a rack six inches from the element. Blackening the chilies and garlic under the broiler gives the sauce a complex charred flavor. Arrange the jalapenos and garlic on a rimmed baking sheet and broil, turning as necessary until the chilies are evenly blistered and the garlic skins are spotted brown, about 10 minutes. Cover with foil and let sit until cool enough to handle. That takes another 10 minutes. Peel, stem, and seed the chilies and garlic, trimming away any scorched bits. For our herbs, we went all in on cilantro. Like many herbs, cilantro is edible from root to flower, so we are gonna use both the leaves and the stems. Finally, in a food processor, combine the chilies, garlic, cilantro, six tablespoons extra virgin olive oil, one tablespoon lime juice, half teaspoon sugar, and three quarter teaspoon kosher salt. Process until smooth, one to two minutes, scraping the bowl as needed. This adobo lasts for up to three weeks in the refrigerator. Today at Milk Street, I've invited a friend, Lior Lev Serkars. How are you? Hi, Chris. This is your book, which, uh, which I love, by the way, The Spice Companion. Thank you. Here's a question. So salt and pepper. Salt is very different than pepper. Why do they go together? The only two things people had in Northern Europe for 200 years? I also don't understand why salt and pepper made it to every household around the planet and the rest of these beautiful ingredients didn't. I also think that uh, we should talk about sodium and heat versus talking about salt and pepper. Uh, you do need some sodium in your food because it highlights flavors, and the heat also highlights flavor, and they balance each other, and they elevate other flavors. I like to have a few salts handy when I cook because they don't deliver the same function. The first one would be gray sea salt, which is unrefined, great content of, of iodine and really this kind of sea ocean uh, flavor that I like to use when I blanch uh, vegetables or cook pasta to give the water a lot of flavor. You could actually tell if it was gray sea salt versus, let's say, table salt, really, I in the pasta? Yeah, you'd know the difference. I also like to really season my water, like heavily salted water, to season the vegetable or the pasta so that I can save a step later on. And then uh, we have something like fleur de sel. It's this beautiful fine crystals. It would be a shame to use it for boiling water or sauces, more for a final seasoning. Um, Molden salt from the UK, uh, these beautiful uh, fine pyramids. Again, a very delicate, beautiful salt that delivers not only the sodium, but texture. So as you're eating uh, a dish or a vegetable or, or a piece of meat, you start chewing on these crystals and they release more flavors. And then table salt, which 
has not a lot left in it in terms of flavor and scent. Fantastic because it dissolves very quickly. And when I um, season things, if I'm not looking for a textural aspect, this would probably be the salt that I'd be using. So we started with salt and pepper. You corrected me at sodium and heat. We did sodium, heat. Heat. So heat is important. It elevates flavor. It also numbs part of, of the tongue or of our palate and actually elevates other flavors such as sweetness and, and acidity. Traditional black pepper, whether whole or ground. White pepper, it's a phenomenal product that delivers less heat but more floral notes. Beyond the salt and pepper, like you asked earlier, there's so much more that you can add to your food in ways that you could sort of trick your brain in a way, things like chipotles, this really nice uh, smoky note to them that uh, can recreate a sort of a grilling sensation to some extent. I think there's a couple of things that uh, people should know of and start using more often in their everyday cooking or eating. One of them being nigella seeds. What's this? Uh, mm. Yeah, and mm. they offer a great scent of onion, garlic, a little oregano-ish with a nuttiness to them uh, and a texture sprinkling it on something like a, a cucumber or radish or a piece of fruit, pimenton or smoked paprika, traditionally made in Spain by smoking the peppers over oak wood. Again, delivering this great depth and, and smoky scent that you would think that you're eating the most complex protein or meat that's just being grilled. If I wanted to make a blend um, instead of just buying one, how do you do that? So I think the advantage of making your blends at home is that you're gonna use more. And making a blend is fairly easy. Let's say you were thinking about a little bit of heat, so you're gonna get a little bit of black peppercorn, sweetness and floral notes, the cinnamon and the clove, and then the savory component will come from the cumin, and then grind them. The advantage is that they're ready to use. You would have a jar of your signature blend versus having them in a whole format and separate, which makes it difficult to use. So the one thing, I'm gonna do a lot of things, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try the gray sea salt in the pasta and blanching vegetables. Even if I can't taste the difference, I'll tell you I did. Because <laughs> it'll be too embarrassing if I can't tell. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Here at Milk Street, we like to uh, upset traditions. And when you think of guacamole, you always think about lime juice and garlic. And we're here to tell you that ain't necessarily so, right? This is my kind of recipe, your kind of recipe, because it involves no bull. Also involves no lime juice and no garlic. Traditional central Mexican guacamole doesn't have lime juice or garlic. Definitely no strange ingredients like they have here sometimes in the US. Corn and peas and kale and bacon. None of that, but definitely no garlic. Mm -hmm. So to make this traditional central Mexican guacamole, I'm going to start with a white onion. I'm going to use two tablespoons of this. And here's the good news. You don't need to mince this finely. It's just finely chopped. And the reason we're doing this in a, a chop and not a mince is also so that we don't lose all the onion flavor on the board. For lazy cooks, this is a good first step. I think there was a hidden message there. So we're going to take two tablespoons of this. So the next thing I'm going to use is a serrano chili. You can use one or two. I'm feeling kind today, so I'm only going to subject you to one. But here's the kicker, we're going to keep the seeds in the serrano chili. And that is another key thing that we learned about traditional guacamole, you need some of that heat that's going to balance out the acid and the fat. So again, this is also going to be finely chopped, not minced. You do want to be careful when you're working with hot chili peppers, but you should know that from working with me. <laughs> so I'm going to take my chilies. They're also going into the bowl. To this, I'm going to add two tablespoons of chopped cilantro and a half teaspoon of kosher salt. And the kosher salt is gonna start helping the cells break down into the onions. We are gonna be mashing this in something people have at home. We're gonna be using a bowl. But traditionally, what is used is a stone mortar and pestle called a molcajete, and we actually have one We have right one here. right there. You want something really heavy, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is pretty simple. We're going to use the bottom and the sides of um, a dry measuring cup. And we want to mash this to a rough paste. It takes about a minute and some elbow grease. And this is going to start drawing moisture and flavor out of our first ingredients. And sales of mortar and pestles will skyrocket all across America during the filming of the segment. They are really handy. Yeah. They're great for spices. So this is about done. It's a, a rough paste, really. 
and we're going to move on to our avocados. Now with avocados for this recipe, you do want to make sure you pick a good avocado. It wants to have smooth flesh on the outside. The trick really is you, you apply gentle pressure near the stem and if there's a slight give, then that's a good avocado. If there's too much, it's no good. If it's too firm, no good. So here I have a rather good looking avocado. We're going to use three of these and this is going to go into our bowl along with the other ingredients. So I'm just going to scoop the flesh. You sort of said that like rather handsome avocado. <laughs> if you're fishing for compliments, Chris, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But I will make you a tasty guacamole. That's, that's, uh, that's a good better. runner up. That's a good runner up. I'll take it. Thank you very much. We have the creamy richness of uh, ripe avocados. We have some pungency from the onions that have been softened with salt. And then we have the grassiness of cilantro and a little bit of heat and also some herbaceous notes from the serrano chili. This is the easy part. We're going to mash the avocado straight into our other ingredients. So I'm going to finish mashing this in the bowl and then we're going to come back and add our secret ingredient. So Chris, the burning question I had when we learned this recipe was, if not lime juice, then what? And a big, a big part of the lime juice's function that people use it for is to prevent oxidation, that sort of ugly browning that happens when avocados are released into the wild, when their flesh gets oxidized. So we need something to fix the oxidation. And what would that be? But it's not lime. Not lime. We're going to use tomatoes. They have a much gentler taste and they still provide enough acidity for the guacamole not to brown. So I have here 10 ounces or one pint of grape tomatoes, which are much more easy available. If you can get uh, in-season, really ripe tomatoes, then that is the best to use, but we don't always have that. And these uh, taste a little better than the typical supermarket tomato, right? Those give me the shudders. Don't. Are you okay? <laughs> don't even. I hate those. So I'm going to use about half, and they are going to stabilize the color of the guacamole. So give that a quick stir. And now, cook's privilege, first dibs. More salt. More salt. Also remember with guacamole, we typically eat them with tortilla chips. So I personally prefer to undersalt my guac a little bit because the rest is going to be made up from the chips. It is fiesta time. So would you put like three serranos in yours? I think there's a balance between heat and flavor and retaining your sense of taste and not burning your tongue off. So I'm just adding the remainder of my chopped tomatoes on top and two more tablespoons of cilantro because I can never get enough cilantro. It almost seems a shame to dig into that, but I don't really care. Go ahead. Here we go. Let's taste it. Mmm. Well, there's the heat. It's got the heat. It's got the heat. And it's surprising because you'd, you mm. think you'd miss the lime and you don't miss the lime. You know, in Milk Street, we always say simplest is best, but it, it has the onions, it has the cilantro, it has the heat of the serranos in it, obviously it has that creaminess of the avocado, it has the brightness. I mean, it's, it's simple, but it's much better. So we learned today at Milk Street how to make guacamole without garlic, without lime juice, use the tomatoes, and actually we used a mortar and pestle, but just used a bowl to get those ingredients to actually bring out their flavor. You can get this recipe, which you absolutely should do, and all the recipes from this season at MilkStreetTV.com.